Sefer Devarim, Parshat Shoftim, on environmental protection. In Parshat Shoftim, we read what's often described as the Israelites' constitution. And along with outlining the roles of various officials and procedures for various conflicts, our Parsha gives us one law that isn't so obvious to include, a prohibition of destroying fruit trees. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 20, when in your war against the city, you have to besiege it a long time in order to capture it, you must not destroy its trees, wielding the axe against them. You may eat of them, but you must not cut them down. Are trees of the field human to withdraw before you in the besieged city? Only trees that you know do not yield food may be destroyed. You may cut them down for constructing siege works against the city that is waging war on you until it has been reduced. Even the line of reasoning we're given here is fascinating. Are trees of the field human to withdraw before you into the besieged city? We can't destroy these trees because they're innocent. This Forno explains. Four, is a tree of the field equivalent to a human being? capable of defending itself and therefore po posing a danger to you? Neither is it able to surrender on account of the siege. Seeing that this is so, even though part of its timber could serve as a rampart for helping you to mount an attack against the city itself, since this will not be achieved directly by cutting down these trees, it is not proper for you to destroy such trees, as opposed to your being permitted to kill human beings in that city, opposing you and endangering you. Rabbi Nachman, however, reads this verse counterintuitively. Are the trees and the people the same? Of course they are. How come? Rabbi Nachman taught, disagreement raises and elevates a person with increased zeal in the service of God. This is because one can read Deuteronomy as saying, man is the tree of the field. Now, a tree laying on the ground cannot possibly raise itself up, except when floodwaters come over it. Then the water picks up and carries the tree. The controversy is called water, as it is written, they surround me like water all day long. Together they encircled me. And so in the plain sense of the Torah, we cannot cut down the trees because they're innocent and incapable of running away. But also more mystically, the trees are just like us in that they are helpless unless they receive a boost from the environment around them. In any case, it's from this law we get a Jewish principle of Baal Tashchit the prohibition against wanton destruction. It's tempting to try to limit this concept to cutting down of fruit trees, but it's clear that many of our consumption habits today are inextricably a part of this problem. According to the Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, humanity has severely altered 75% of the Earth's land area and 66% of its marine environments. Further, according to the United Nations, around 3.2 billion people, or 40% of the global population, are adversely affected by land degradation, and 100 to 300 million people are at increased risk of floods and hurricanes because of coastal habitat loss. If we don't figure out how to stop destroying creation through drilling oil, driving cars, factory farming for food, draining our natural resources for technology parts, we certainly will not be living up to the Torah's demands. The 19th century German rabbi, Shimshon Rafal Hirsch, understood this, and he condemned wasteful behavior in the harshest terms. He wrote, do not destroy anything is the first and most general call of God. If you should now raise your hand to play a childish game, to indulge in senseless rage, wishing to destroy that which you should only use, wishing to exterminate that which you should only exploit, if you should regard the beings beneath you as objects without rights, not perceiving God who created them, and therefore desire that they feel the might of your presumptuous mood, instead of using them only as the means of wise human activity, then God's call proclaims to you, do not destroy anything. Be a mensch, only if you use the things around you for wise human purposes, sanctified by the word of my teaching. Only then are you a mensch and have the right over them which I have given you as a human. However, if you destroy, if you ruin, at that moment you are not a human, but an animal and have no rights to the things around you. That's Rav Hirsch. The Jewish tradition is not messing around regarding the importance of it. And in our time, we are called to be more stringent on these matters than ever. 
with similar intensity to Hirsch's. The Midrash Kohelet Rabbah paints a picture of God guiding Adam around and explaining the seriousness of humanity's responsibility as the defenders of creation. It says, Holy One be blessed created Adam the first person. He took him and showed him all the trees in the Garden of Eden, and he said to him, See my creations, how beautiful and exemplary they are. Everything I created, I created for you. Make certain that you do not ruin and destroy my world, as if you destroy it. There will be no one to mend it after you. Friends, to be sure, living in the world requires some balance between preservation and manipulation of the world we live in. And this is reflected in the Torah. We can eat from the trees, but we can't cut them down. And the trees that do not produce food can be cut down so that we can build bulwarks in their place. When God places the first human in the Garden of Eden, it is to till it and defend it. Those counterbalancing needs, though, make it difficult for individuals to take strong, impactful action on environmental issues. This makes it necessary for governments to implement systemic changes on the policies that will impact humanity for generations to come. And these decisions aren't easy to make. Businesses want to maximize their profits and employ lots of people. Developing nations want to gain economic security. And people around the world want the increased comfort and quality of life that come at an environmental cost. Here, too, we can remember the case in the Torah. It is specifically in the conflict and anxiety of war that the Israelites must practice restraint. In the most difficult of times, we are told to stay calm, follow ethical principles, and plan wisely for the future. When we fall into anxiety, it is more important than ever to stick to our principles and live up to our most cherished moral demands. We cannot allow the distracting pressures of the world to defeat our drive toward doing what is right. It was even taught by the Baal Shem Tov that the good inclination is represented by the fruit tree we're commanded to protect. As the Zohar makes a connection between Eitzah, trees, and the Meya Eitz, the advisor who brings people to do tshuva. The good inclination, then, which brings us to repentance is a tree. The Baal Shem Tov said a person should test if the inclination to do good rules, to do good, rules them and advises them well. If we're ruled by the Yitzhahara, the evil inclination, we can imagine the fruit as having fallen to the ground. <clears throat> since evil, do, evil deeds are the husks and externals of the fruit. However, if we're ruled by the tree of the good inclination, the eights, the eights of the Yitzhar Tov, we'll do good do deeds, harvesting whole fruits straight from the tree. Despite all of the anxieties we face, we are tasked with standing strong and adhering to the good inclination regarding the environment. If we give in to the pressure that causes despair, all of humanity will pay the price. Shabbat Shalom.